as we continue this discussion about faith and works and about the end times and prophecy and how everything ties together, what does God ask of us in these last days? Now, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ or you have not accepted him as your savior and you're listening to this for the first time, I'm going to do a little preaching. If you are saved and you know that Jesus dwells inside you through the Holy Spirit and you're looking for instruction on these last days, what the word says, because you want to be obedient to what he says, I'm going to do a little teaching. But this is really important. Because God's very specific about what Christians are supposed to be doing in these days. And so far, we're not seeing a lot of that these days. Now, the, the pandemic closed a bunch of churches. Churches have gone woke. And there are people falling away. Second Thessalonians tells us there'll be a great apostasy. People falling away from the faith. But Jesus was very clear. And the word of God is very clear. It doesn't change. And so what we've been called to do from the beginning is still yet what we are supposed to do. Doing being part of God's will and doing being a part of and being of all about the Father's business until he returns. And the Bible, Jesus says, hey, make sure you're doing what I've told you to do when I return. That you're not sleeping, you're not drunk, you're not... You have a gun in your house to lock yourself in to avoid the hard stuff that's happening these days. You can have a tremendous impact on people who are looking for answers. So I just want to give you some thoughts. And I want to give you some practical advice as the Bible tells us. Remember, the word is never changing. The, never will never fa the word will never fade away. God says, look, the flowers fade, the grass withers, the flower fades, but my word will never fade. It's eternal. And we learn in the Psalms that God's word is more important than even his name. So we have to trust it. We have to trust it. Bury it inside our heart and understand by instruction, right? Because Timothy, Paul tells Timothy that the word is good for getting right, staying right, knowing what's wrong and knowing what's right. We, the word can give us instruction about our life. So Matthew chapter 24, known as the Olive Discourse, is Jesus telling his disciples what to look for in the end of days. And just for review so we can see it, I want you to see that we're talking about the same time frame. And it could very well be this time frame that we're living in right now. Look what it says. Chapter 24, verse 4. Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. And they will deceive many and you will hear of wars and threats of wars. But don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all this, only the first of the birth pangs with more to come. Jesus says, look, all this stuff's going to happen. There's going to be deception and wars and rumors of wars. And there's going to be diseases and there's going to be racial tensions. And there's going to be battles and there's going to be all of this stuff coming upon the earth. And that's just the beginning of it. Now we know in my, in my studies, I've, I've learned that the, those things that Jesus says, hey, these are going to come upon the earth are the same as the four horsemen that are seen in the six seal judgments that Jesus unlatches after the rapture of the church. But all of these things have been happening since the beginning of time. And so we need to understand that Jesus is saying, yep, these things are going to be going on. They have been going on. It's not the end of the world. It's just going to show you leading up until this point when all this stuff's going to fall apart. We need to see that when the shadows of everything that's going to be fulfilled in the seven-year tribulation is cast from outside it, we're close. And that's what Jesus is saying. The end is not yet, but be ready because just like a woman who is in labor, those pains start to get harder, more uh, severe, closer together as the birthing process starts and moves through. And in Revelation chapter 1, John writing Jesus' words, it says that it says that, um, shortly after this, uh, that, 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 that statement, it means tacos, T-A-C-H-O-S in the Greek, what it is, where we get tachometer from. So, so things are going to speed up and get faster as we're moving. I just want you to see that that's where we're sitting. 
Now, how long this goes, I don't know. Because no one knows the day or the hour of the coming of, the, of, of Jesus to get his church in the rapture. And nobody knows. I, I'm, I'm sure the Antichrist is alive, but he can't be revealed until the rapture happens. And so we're still kind of waiting for the very next thing to happen. That is the rapture of the church. But in verse 9, it says, Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it. And then the end will come. And I want to... I want to point out two specific points that were just read here between 9 and 14. The first one says, uh, verse 10 says, And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. No doubt that's going on today with social media and the division that's being caused and everybody just hating each other. Nobody nobody wants to come together and, and negotiate how, how we can love each other and disagree. No, it has to be. It has to be venomous in, in, in scope. He says that that'll happen. That'll get worse. That will pick up as we're going. You see it happening now. Verse 11 says, Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. That's happening. Churches have gone woke. They're teaching things that are not biblical. They fail to mention Jesus. That's happening. And look at 12. Sin will be rampant everywhere. If you can't turn on the TV without seeing sin and reports of sin and people wanting sin to be okay and people the crime is up, lawlessness is up, all this stuff making things tremendously uneasy. And look at how that ends. Sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. Do you think that's happening today? Does the love of, of many people, the love of people, even Christians, especially Christians, is the love of Christians growing cold for other people? So much so that violence and all this stuff is, is creating in us this, this, this kind of storm inside our heart that says, you know what, I'm going to hide away and I'm not going to take the word of God to people. I'm not going to bring the love of Jesus to people. I'm not going to do that thing. But guess what? God tells us that's not an option. The Bible doesn't change. The word doesn't change. And up until the very point that he comes to come to comes to get his church, we need to be doing such, to be found doing that work when he comes. He even says up here in verse 9, some will be arrested and persecuted and killed because you are my followers. That means that nobody in the Christian faith went and sat down somewhere and hid away. Bad things will happen to some Christians are being executed. They were just executed just a few days ago in North Korea when they arrested a whole bunch of underground churchgoers and they executed them all. But there is tremendous uh, honor and martyrdom for the name of Jesus Christ. And I'm somewhat jealous of them because they stand before the, the Lord. But as we get closer to the rapture of the church, the, the opportunity to die in Jesus' name versus being raptured up to see Jesus in the air, that time frame is getting shorter and shorter. You're losing, there, we're coming to a point where it's almost negligible. It's not like you die today and then, or, or you live a hundred years. No, no, I don't think it's that quick. So be ready, be ready and be teaching and be caught to doing the father's business when he comes. Well, what does that look like? Jesus was really clear about what it looks like to, to love one another and to love to love God, but we need to be set up first. We need to be living a correct lifestyle. The heart needs to be set up in the way that we want it to be. And Jesus in John chapter 15, as he's giving the final instructions to his disciples, tells us what that should look like. In chapter 15 of John verse one, it says, I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. 
remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Jesus is saying, look, I am the centrality of all that comes through you, through the, through the special, through the Holy Spirit that is in us. He says, look, when the spirit is working through me and you're connected to my word, doing and being obedient to what I have to say, then you will bear fruit. You can't bear fruit and do good things. Remember, the, the fruits of the spirit of God are love. There's that word again, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is what it means to abide in Christ. And he's saying, if you want to have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, those are all things that, uh, that there's no law against them. And our world is missing the mark in these things because everyone is growing cold. The love of many is growing cold. And people are hating one another and division and lawlessness and sin and all these things, scary and anxiety and difficulty and hardship. It's all coming. Jesus said, I don't care what comes upon the world. I'm going to tell you what's going to come. I need you to be my disciples. And you stay connected to the vine so that the fruit of God would not, would not fail, that you would continue to make fruit. By the way, making fruit and being fruitful is not work. It just comes as being obedient to the Lord. If it's, a, if it's an orange tree... You don't see an orange tree struggling to make oranges. It just comes. It draws water and nutrients from the soil, goes up and into the branches, and it just comes. It's just genetically what it does. And when you've been born again of the, of the Spirit of God, it just comes. It just comes through the Holy Spirit and an abiding life in Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying here. In, an, in a greatly agrarian society, when everyone knows about crops and grains and fruits and how all of this works, when you are a when you grow grapes, and I watched a video about this to get a better idea about it, you take the main vein, the main vein, this trunk that comes out of the out of the uh, out of the ground, and then it branches to two main veins, and then they have four branches that they find the four best branches and they put them up in a place where they can bear a lot of fruit. They prune off of everything that's not fruitful and all that stuff gets burned in the fire. This is, this is an expensive rule if you don't understand what's being said here. Because if you don't bear fruit for God, if you're unfruitful, he's saying, well, the God's going to prune off anything that's unfruitful and all that stuff ends up in the fire. That's hell. That's hell. So be fruitful in these last days. God will protect you and use you in mighty ways when everyone is clamoring for answers. Verse 5 says, Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Now, that's a promise. If you remain in Jesus with the Spirit leading your life and being obedient to the Word of God, He's telling you, you will bear fruit. And then he's gonna, and then he's gonna put you in places to prune you and and refine you and mature you, and then you're gonna make more fruit. I can attest to this. He has been doing this work, a hard work, a difficult work, but a but a fruitful work in my life over this last year, year and a half. It's amazing to look back to where I was before and look at me now and what God has done in my life. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. And then you produce much fruit and you are my true disciples. The, this brings great glory to my Father. Now we need to be careful because if you are not in the vine, if you are not in the Spirit of God, if you are not then this sounds like you could just have a genie in a bottle and ask whatever you want and God will give you anything he wants. And then when you go and ask for a million dollars and he doesn't give it to you, you're like, well, well, this is a lie. He didn't do that. But if you're truly rem remained in the vine and you are led by the spirit, then the things you ask for will be in line with God's will. You will just ask for the things that bear fruit and bearing fruit comes true and God will use it in amazing ways. 
It's a mentality. It's a heart of giving yourself over to God and giving, getting rid of yourself. Jesus says, take up your cross daily and follow me. What that means is die to yourself and die to your own wants and your own needs and your own prides and your own arrogance and all that crap. And turn around and, and seek after what I have for your life. What that is, is love for other people. Seeing other people higher than I see myself. It says that in Philippians chapter 2. See other people higher than I see myself. That is the beginning of loving one another. Verse 9. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my Love. Yeah, so he's changed it to abiding in fruit. And it's, now it's, he's changing the idea because bearing fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithful, gentle, you know, gentleness, and self-control is, uh, is all what comes out of a, of a life that is committed to loving others. Love. I have loved you, even as the Father has loved me, remain in my love. And when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. If you love me, keep my commandments. <clears throat> I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. I can attest to that. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. That's a sacrificial love. We call this agape love. Agape love is love that you give without expecting in return. God's love is perfect agape love. He gives to you freely. He doesn't expect you to give back to him, but he wants to have a relationship with you. You can choose not to believe in God. You can choose to walk away from God. You can choose to be your own God. You can do all these things, and he will respond in kind. But to love God is to love one another. Jesus has said it here. Keep my commandments and love other people like I loved you. This is agape love. And so if you're loving your enemy as yourself, then and they're not paying you back, well, you're still loving other people. He wants you to give love you don't expect in return. Because everyone, even wicked people and evil people and sinful people, and all, love certain kinds of people that love them back in return. And so many times we say, well, if they don't love me, then I don't love them. And that's not what God, that's not what Jesus is saying here. We have to be the salt and light of the world in a time when love is fading, when a time when, when the hearts of many are growing cold, we need to burn with Jesus's love for others. And in doing so, maybe it brings some people with you when the rapture comes. Verse 12, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because the master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends. And since I have told you everything the father told me, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command love each other. Jesus is very clear here. He doesn't pull punches. You need to love people in the midst of me loving them. And what is the greatest picture of love ever to be written in the pages of any book, every, any, at any point, any time, anywhere? Jesus came, a sinless man who didn't deserve to die and died the worst death ever to have been concocted on earth. So that our sins could be revealed, they could be squashed, and they could be swept away. And so that we can be seen as, as sanctified, set apart for God again. That the blood that he shed, the pain that he endured, the suffering, the torture, and God turning his back on his own son for a while would have had to have been the worst thing ever to have ever been Oh, man, I can't even, I can't even put it to words. But Jesus loved us so much that he, God loved the world so much. He gave his only begotten son and, and he who, who believes in him will, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16 says it succinctly in one verse. 
the love of God, the agape love of God. Now, he, he wants you to take the gift of salvation, but he doesn't force you to do that. That's your choice. Remember, salvation is really cheap for you, but it wasn't cheap for him. So live a life that accepts that gift from God through his son, Jesus, and love one another as Jesus loved us. So that's what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to abide in him and he wants us to abide in him and bear fruit. And bear fruit means to bear love for one another because there were 10 commandments among other kinds of laws in the, in the Old Testament, but he, he whittled those commandments down to two commandments, the law of Christ. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And so I, what I'm saying here is, is Jesus told us this and then went to the cross. And he has already told these guys, be ready, persecution, difficulty, hardship. It's all coming. It's all coming in my name and you will all die for this. And you may be imprisoned and you may be murdered and you may deal with hardship and difficulty. They may laugh at you. They may scorn at you. You may feel uncomfortable. Persecution may come. It's coming. It's all coming. Difficulties come. Paul tells us that through many tribulations, we save our soul. But he's saying, don't change what I'm telling you. This is my command, love each other. Well, so then as we get into the epistles of Paul and Peter, there are places here that are very practical about what that looks like as a Christian. What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to act? The first one is in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 9. Paul writes to the church in Rome, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. And take delight in honoring each other. There it is again. Love one another and put them higher than you see yourself. A sacrificial love. There is no greater love than a sacrificial love for your brethren. Verse 11, never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone else. Do you see all of what he's talking about here? Love, joy, peace, patience with people, kindness to people gentleness with people, self-control in yourself. Don't lose your cool. Don't seek to revile other people who revile you. Don't, don't one-up them in the midst of trying to get even. Don't, you see it? Do you see it? Love one another and via, via through that, abide and bear fruit in the Lord. Keep on praying. Keep on seeking them. Keep on being there. Keep loving people. Have a mind to help and give people the best places in your life. Dear friends, verse 19, never take revenge. Leave that the righteous anger, uh, leave that to the righteous anger of God for the scriptures say, I will take revenge and I will pay back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you but conquer evil by doing good. This whole thing in verse 21, don't let evil conquer you, but let conquer evil by doing good is simple. Evil is darkness. The love of Christ is light. We see that all throughout uh, John's first letter in 1 John. That God is light and in him there is no darkness. And the darkness can't overcome the light. So bring light to the darkness. They cannot win. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we will win our brothers back from difficulty and from death. We're looking at a time here when we need to ramp up our behavior so that these people, these people and these situations, the people that are drowning in their own sins, 
are 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 easily that we can bring them back from the brink. It reminds me of Proverbs chapter twenty four verse eleven. Proverbs twenty four verse eleven. Here's what it says. It says, rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to die. Save them as they stagger to their death. Don't excuse yourself by saying, look, we didn't know. For God understands all hearts and he sees you. He who guards your soul knows you knew. And he will repay all people as their actions deserve. He says, look, you are a watchman on a wall. Stand on it and tell people that they're marching to their sinful death and try to save them. If in Ezekiel, it tells us that if you stand on a wall and you tell somebody they're going to their death and they accept their death, that's on them. But it is our job. We know the truth and we need to share that truth with others. So as we're going through this in Romans, it says, look, you need to love people for sure. You've got to be a genuine love and you've got to have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against other people, even those you don't like, even those that are your enemy. Because agape love is giving love without return. Remember that forgiveness is part of love. And if you do not forgive others, Jesus will not present you as forgiven before the Lord. And that is a strong statement. Because you got to forgive him because he forgave you. All of this horrible stuff you've been forgiven by him dying on the cross. And you can't turn around and forgive somebody else of something small. He will see that as, as you being unloving. And that's, that's dangerous. That's dangerous when Jesus has loved you so much. And God has loved you so much. Paul continues in his letter to the Thessalonians. Here's some more stuff, just more practical advice about how Christians should be behaving in a day like today. Chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12. Dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work and live peacefully with each other. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy encourage those who are timid take tender care of those who are weak and be patient with everyone there's that word again patience what remember the 12 when you look at the fruits of the spirit now joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control all of those are byproducts of the first one love so it's love which brings joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All these things, you need to memorize them. Put them in your heart. Eat them. Devour them as your daily food. Because bearing fruit is to bear the fruits of the Spirit. And we bring those to people who are struggling, even when they don't like us in return. That's God's heart for us. Live peacefully with each other. Be careful what you're posting. Be careful what you're, what you're putting on social media. Be careful how you're responding to people who, who don't believe or don't agree with you. Be careful how you respond. Live at peace when you can with everyone. Verse 14. Uh, no, sorry. Verse 15. See that no one pays back evil for evil. There's that evil for evil thing again. Don't do it. If they say something evil about you, don't respond in kind. You need to bless them, pray for them, move on them, forgive them, and move on. Live at peace with everyone. <clears throat> See that no one pays evil back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. <clears throat> always be joyful. Never stop praying. That praying part is important because you need to keep the lifeline between you and God open. We have that opportunity. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible tells us that that veil that split the temple, the, 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 holy, the holy place versus the holiest of holy places where the ark was, where God sat, where, where the, the head priest could go in there only one day a year, that, that giant veil tore in two. Symbolically, that means that you don't need a priest to go in for you, but you can go to the throne room of God by yourself, sitting where you are right now, listening to this, called on his name. Keep on praying. Praying is just a discussion with, with the God of heaven. 
So you, you give him, you talk to him and he talks to you back through the word and through, through feelings in your heart and the understanding of what the word says about living your life. That's why this is so important because living, living the word of God never changes. It has never changed. It never will change. The word of God is eternal, just like the souls of men. So get this going now. Get this as a, you want, this has got to be something you do all the time. Pray, pray. And it doesn't have to be with great, big, fruitful, long-winded, fruitful, religious texts. Just have a conversation with the God who loves you. Keep on praying. Verse 18, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Be thankful for all the things he gives you. I tell you, when you start praying about thankfulness about that, you will start seeing you're thankful for everything. And that is what God's heart is. Keep on praying. Be thankful for everything that he's done for you because he all good and all perfect gifts come from the father of lights comes down from the one and he's never turning there it says there is no shadow of turning what that means is is he never changes you know when the sun moves and you're standing there there's a shadow and that shadow moves as the sun moves but he is pure light he doesn't cast a shadow nothing changes he is unchanging be thankful in all your circumstances for this is god's will for you to belong to christ jesus this brings another thing to my heart here that hell will be completely and utterly avoid, uh, devoid of God's goodness. There will be nothing to be thankful for. Even when you don't believe in God, even when you're at your worst, even when these, all this is going on, Jesus, God is still paying you some blessings. So as for, to get you to realize that God is taking care of you and he's giving you all these things, he's trying to get you to come to him and repent of your sins. And then the blessings will overflow even more. But people who think, well, I'm just going to go and live my sinful life in hell, it will be completely devoid of all good things because God is the father of all good things. Take that into consideration when you're making your decisions. <clears throat> always be joyful, never stop praying, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. And do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. Take the split. What it's saying here is, is don't stifle the Holy Spirit. The only unforgivable sin is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That is to speak against and not believe in the Holy Spirit. That will lead you to hell without being able to, to, to repent of it. Which, if you're watching this and believing anything that I'm saying, you haven't got there yet. Do not scoff at prophecies, things that are coming. Don't... <laughs> Revel the book of Revelation is the only book that will give you a blessing if you read it and live it out and understand it. Uh, God is a God of prophecy. He's told you the end from the beginning. Don't scoff at that stuff. These things are happening right now and you're running out of time. And if you want to say that all this stuff has happened and where is the promise of his coming, like it says in 1 Peter chapter 5, all of these things. If you want to get involved in that, then go for it. That's fine. But be careful not to scoff at prophecies because God has already told you what to look for. We're seeing it. It's only your fault if you choose not to believe. Stay away. And, and so take that. Uh, it says, test everything that is said. That means test it to the word. When someone comes to you and tells you something, test it against the word of God. Make sure that if the word of God is, is good with that, then cool. Here's a, here is a, uh, a quick example. Marijuana in Colorado is legal, but the Bible says it's a sin. So which one is it? Is it legal or is it a sin? Well, the Bible says it's sin. Therefore, it's evil. Stay away from it. That's what it says. The law is written by men who are sinful. And they're allowed, if you're watching it, sinful stuff is becoming more sinful. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20 tells us that woe to those who call evil good and good evil. For bitter, who trade bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Light for darkness and darkness for light. We're getting to a place where people are trying to get out of the way. They're in the fight. That Psalm 2 battle against God and against his anointed one. It says, let's break us our chains of, of this morality that God has given us. Let's, let's get away from him and make our own tower to the heavens. God laughs. That's what it says in Psalm 2. 
hold hold on to what is good and stay away from every kind of evil just fix your life to what you're doing to be if you read this book and follow what it says you can't go wrong because the life the instructions for life are written in the pages of this book well just to show you that this isn't only a paul thing here's peter in first peter uh, chapter 3, discussing the same kinds of things. What are we supposed to do in difficulties? Now, this is interesting because First Peter is a, is a letter written to the, to the Gentile Christians and to the Jews who are being heavily persecuted across the nation and across the, uh, across the world right now because the, they're coming against anybody who believed in Jesus. And so these guys are on the run. And, he, and Peter's, like, Peter's writing this letter saying, God, guys, just hold on to what you have because persecution's coming. Jesus told us it was going to be this way. It's going to be hard, but you have promises in heaven waiting for you. Things that cannot, you know, promises that can't mold. They can't, they can't rust. They can't be stolen. They can't defeat. It's waiting for you, a promise. And so just hold on to what you have. And so Peter says, look, even in the midst of the difficulty that you're having, I need you to act a certain way. This is what it means to be a Christian. Now, listen, a lot of the same words, a lot of the same thoughts, and a lot of the same ideas. Why? Because the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible through men and there's no contradictions. And so what we're supposed to be is believed on by everyone who authored a book in the Bible. First Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Be single-minded. Everybody should be moving in the right direction. That does not mean, however that we believe everything the same that we're that we're robots but we need to be we need to be tied down by the bounds of love, of Jesus' love. He said, love one another and love each other and take care of one another. And when you get a whole bunch of people together thinking high, everyone else is higher than themselves and loving each other and giving of each other and all these, you can't go wrong. You're in the same mind, believing in Jesus Christ. That's why it's so important to gather in a church in these last days. Hebrews tells us, don't don't reject the gathering as time draws near to the end. That's what he says. We need to be in fellowship with like-minded people so that when things get hard, we can bear each other's burdens and we can weep with those who weep and, and rejoice with those who rejoice. That's what this, all of this is a package about what, who, and who we are supposed to be and who we're supposed to follow. Be of one mind, sympathize with each other, love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tender hearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. There's that again. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and He will grant you this. Uh, he will grant you His blessing. Remember, don't pay evil for evil. Allow God to have vengeance on people right? We're supposed to give love without expecting it in return. So if somebody pays you evil, pay them with a blessing, pray for them and hope that God will use them and turn them. Heaping hot coals on their head. That was, that was Paul's thing back in Romans. What that means is, is when somebody comes to you with wickedness and you turn around and give something to drink or give them something to eat or give them the clothes off your back or give them some sort of respect and forgiveness, then they're going to go in and they're going to have, hopefully, the spirit then convicts them of their sin and they feel ashamed that they treated you one way and you treated them completely opposite and maybe you saved their soul that way that's what god is saying forgive them as i have forgiven you verse 10 for the scripture says if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies turn away from evil and do good search for peace and work to maintain it the eyes of the lord watch over those who do right and his ears and open to their prayers. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. And that was, that was Psalm 34, verse 12 through 16, being quoted in the New Testament by Peter in his letter here. Because the New Testament verifies what was said in the Old Testament. You want to be a part of that. You need to know both sides. You need the entire counsel of God. But as we close, what does all of this mean? mean we noticed and we talked about very specifically one very important thing and that thing is love 
God, God's love for us should be paid back to other people in kind if not more than he has given because we have been blessed with all of this tremendous blessing and now we need to get it back and we need to give it back in kind. And so to, to close, I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now this is affectionately called the chapter of love and I want you to listen to it as we close. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but I didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. It means that I could, I could speak all kinds of languages and I could say big frilly words and I could do all these things. I could have all kinds of talents and all kinds of power. I could speak with power and I could, I could, I could move people with my words. But if I don't do that in love, then I'm just making noise. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all the knowledge and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but I didn't love others, I would be nothing. Again, I could do all these powerful things of my own self and you could think that I'm something special but if I'm not using those gifts God has given me to love others, then I'm nothing. It, it, it bears me no value in the eternal, in the afterlife or anything else that I do and it won't bear fruit. God will stifle it if love is not involved in it. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. For love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or, or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking is an unknown language and special knowledge will come useless. But love will last forever. And now our knowledge is partial and incomplete. And even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But when we will see it, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but when I will know every but then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. That that. See, we, we we read the Bible and we're not sure totally what's happening, and we don't know the time frames, and we're waiting with this understanding to have faith in something we've never seen, but we love him anyway. There's a blessing in that. Tom, when Thomas doesn't understand Jesus, he says, Jesus is, Thomas tells the guys, look, I'm not going to believe it's Jesus until I see him and I see those holes in his hands and I put my hand in that gash in his side. And Jesus says, look, come over here and look, look at me. It's me, Thomas. And then he says, blessed are, the, blessed are you for knowing me and believing in me, but blessed are those who believe in me, even though they don't see me. See, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And faith is important because it's impossible to please God without faith, without believing that he is who he is and that he is a, and that he will give us the gifts and the blessings that we so desire and he desires to give us as a loving father. But there's coming a day when all of this faith that we need, won't, we won't need it anymore because we will stand before him and we will know him as he knows us. That is is the end game. A wonderful thing to look Jesus in the eyes, to see his, to see the color of his eyes and to feel his embrace when we meet him finally face to face. Then it won't be looking like in a mirror. Back then the mirrors were not very clear. They were, they were polished metal. So you didn't get a perfect reflection, but there are coming a day when you'll get a reflection of Jesus just as he, he gets a reflection. He knows exactly who you are. You'll know who he is too. And it finishes three things will be forever. Faith, hope, and love. 
And the greatest of these is love. Agape love, love that we give to others, that we don't expect in return. But this is what Jesus has asked Christians to be in the last days. As hard as it is, as difficult as it is, as it seems as though it doesn't pay back, it does, I promise you. You're heaping up treasures in heaven. And when you get there, you will see that what you have done to be obedient to the word of God here will pay you back in kind, in better ways in the future, in, in, in what's called the days or the, or the time frame yet to come. That's eternity. Listen, Christian, we have to be loving. We have to be the salt and light of the world because the darkness is closing in. Darkness cannot overcome light. So even a match in a pitch black room brings tremendous light to the occasion. Step up and put on the armor of God and let's be ready to love one another so that the love of many isn't us when it grows cold. They can talk about anybody else we want to, but us as Christians, us as those who's hearing my voice, watching this video, understanding, don't let the love of you grow cold. I hope this encourages you. Paul or Peter in his letter in First and Second Peter are encouraging people in really, really hard situations. And he promises them wonderful things. And I'm doing so with you now too. As things fall apart, as lawlessness grows, as crime grows, as decisions don't make any sense, as war grows, as natural disasters grow, as economic failure grows, as the food shortages grow, as all this stuff comes, I'm encouraging you, Christian, that Jesus is coming soon and we will be taken out of here as promised in the Bible. For Jesus loves us and he is faithful. I love you guys. Blessings.